So I'd like to begin by asking you, what do you think is the most important thing to remember about self-help graphics or your time there at self-help graphics? Two different questions. The most important one was that there was a nexus, there was a place that essentially provided opportunity for creativity. It was the source of creativity, it was the source of programming, it was a gallery space, but most important and most basic to the idea was that this was a place where when the doors opened, artists were welcome in, they could come together, they could convene, create together, um, get to know each other, uh, strategize on career development, and this was also a place where audiences knew they could come and have that experience of what was being done there. I, I think I said it before in the first interview, in the first part of this interview, that the most important thing that happened every day was opening the doors, because that's what, what was needed. And at that time, which was in the early 70s, uh, at a time when it was extremely tempestuous, uh, very, very uh, crazy, I think if you talk about the Chicano movement, you don't include the Chicano art and culture movement, or vice versa. You're missing a major segment, because they really fed each other. When all the speeches are done, and when all the clippings are faded, the didactic that you remember are images that Chicano artists were creating at that time. That's what we remember. We see certain pictures and they trigger certain things. Uh, whether it be the very, very, you know, nationalistic, you know, reborn Aztec, um, or, uh, you know, being in a Guadalupe, sitting on top of a cactus with an Aztec sword, or whatever it's going to be, you remember the, the, the visuals. Um, that was the most important thing, was that it was the uh, convening of that place. A um, bit of a controversial subject in terms of who did what when. You know, it all came about because Sister Karen, who was herself a printmaker and an artist, was back home in East L.A., right up the hill where she grew up. Uh, she opened up her garage and started doing printmaking and some of the local artists found that to be attractive and started working with her, at which point um, it got to be crowded. When they moved from that garage to a storefront, they moved from a private, collegial relationship to a public relationship. You had a public door onto a public street. That was really, in essence, the beginning. Uh, I know that if you talk to, let's say, Armando Duron, who was very respected, He'll tell you that Carlos, uh, Carlos, uh, Carlos and Antonio Bueno and Antonio um, Ibanez were co-founders. Um, when I asked Karen Bad, what she said was, "Here's the difference. They had very bad blood, by the way. Those two guys and Karen, they really were very acrimonious at the end, a shame, but not unlike so many other things." But what she said, the difference was, is that they did not see this as being something that was meant to be a public forum. It was meant to serve them as the artists only. In the mission statement that I wrote and grew up with and basically, you know, refined, it's that uh, self-help graphics uh, is, is set to, to serve artists, um, uh, community, and all audiences. Artists being first. So, on that plane, what Karen and Carlos and Antonio were saying was primary. But on the secondary and tertiary areas, which was serving community and audiences, Carlos and Antonio, as Karen related to me, because I've never had first voice, uh, was that they didn't want anything to do with that and essentially left the organization. So really, that's why Karen is credited with being the founder, because she was there at the beginning and she was there at the end uh, of her life. Um, when I came on in 1990, the atelier had already started. It had started in 82. And conceptually, the idea was, you know, one artist is being featured and you do 10 editions, and that was Bronk. At the end of that process, after the printer and the artist and the producer and they killed each other, they came up with a better idea, which was, let's do 10 different artists doing one print. But the atelier was the boilerplate, the printmaking. It was perfect for what the aesthetic and the political point of view of self-help was, which was proselytizing the artwork. It was available uh, at, at an acquisition rate and a level of, of, of owning that was far less expensive than buying original art and was commensurate with what the larger community could afford. I'm not talking about the collectors who, you know, were buying, you know, sculptures or whatnot, dirt cheap from artists and they became highly valued. But the idea was 
let's put a print in people's hands. I can remember sitting in the office one day with Karen and seeing this young law student come in and he asked for a Patsy Valdez piece. And Karen quoted him, this is what the donation is. He goes, I don't have it. She goes, what do you have? He goes, I got $30. She goes, well, give me your money and you can have the piece. He walked out with it and I said, Karen, he said, that kid's going to go stick pins in the corners of it in his dorm room. And she goes, that's what I want to happen. And he'll come back and buy art once he becomes a successful lawyer. True to her word, that guy was a key collector. Ten years later, coming back and buying art. Um, and his first piece had been that Patsy Valdez that he finally framed with the pinholes that he had put up in his dorm. So conceptually, there was an egalitarian process involved in the printmaking and it was access. It was also accessing multitude of images to multitude of audiences. You could get a stack of paper and you could send it around the world and you could go forth and proselytize. That's where I came in because when you, the second part of your question was what was significant in terms of my reign of terror. <laughs> um, we had gone through that period of, you know, needing to nationalize the arts in terms of identifying Chicano artists. And from the get-go, it was very diverse. You know, Alex Alfrock was at the very beginning, there was other people, the printer was not a Latino. But the idea was still that, you know, for the most part, you were looking at a reflection of Chicano art, life, and culture through artists, some of whom were Guatemalans and chose to be Chicanos when they were printing, or, you know, which was always a running joke, you know, um, today I'm a Mexican. Uh, but, um, when I came in, the idea was we had done what we had done in terms of already national recognition. There had been a show called the Cotter Show, Chicano Art, uh, something in affirmation. And the real insult to that show was that they had not included self-help. It came in as an afterthought. And this was a very august and respected group of curators who decided, and, and much of it came because Sister Karen didn't go out and say, it's got to be Chicano this and that and the other. It was about creating fine art printmaking. It wasn't rust by cheap posters, it wasn't cheap materials, it was we're going to introduce fine art printmaking as a career builder, as well as elevating the respect of the art and still making it achievable. 